<laughs> Tonight, we're going to be uh, reading from uh, one of my favorite Old Testament prophets. We've been we're looking at the Old Testament prophet. And uh, we're going to be turning to Amos. Amos. Um, I, uh, it's, uh, Amos is like nine chapters. We're not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to kind of jump through. So forgive me, Lou. I'm going to put him to work tonight because uh, we're going to jump through the chapters and just look at some scriptures. Amos is one of my favorite books because you could stand, you could stand in front of a camera at CNN and read Amos and it would be pertinent today. I mean, the same kind of stuff that, was, that, he, that God had told him to confront in his, in his day, the same kind of stuff is going on right here and right now. It's the same kind of stuff. It's, uh, and I always, liked, I always liked the prophet Amos because he's, he was somebody that did not apply for the job of prophet. He, didn't, he, was, he was a farmer, he was a herdman and a, and a fruit picker. And in, in the middle of his job, in a place of, called Tekoa, God said, I have a word that I want you to bring. There was nothing about him that would make, had made him qualified to do this, other than he was a man of God. He believed God. So uh, he was called to bring a message to his people, and it was not a popular message. It was not a you know, an enjoyable, it was not a feel-good, warm, fuzzy message. It was a message challenging them to get right with God. And we could read the same message today. You could get on the TV or the Internet or anywhere, and it's the same, the same kind of stuff. When we read, you're, you're, you're going to see it. Here, a few years ago, we did like an Old Testament, little Old Testament survey, and we went through the book of Amos. And it was, just, it was just like you're reading the newspapers today, just beginning in chapter 1. And, and again, Lou, forgive me, I'm just going to be jumping around, so if he, if he can't keep up, don't blame him, okay? Uh, it says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, that, that would place him about the same time as Isaiah and Micah and uh, even Hosea, they were all about that same time frame. He says, And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, that would have been Jeroboam the second. There were two kings of Jeroboam. Two years before the earthquake. Now, we know nothing about this earthquake. Uh, it's something that must have happened in history. There's, it's nothing that's really recorded uh, in some secular sources, they recorded some earthquakes. We don't really know which one this was, but there was an earthquake. And, uh, and he said in verse 2, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. He's saying there's judgment coming to this land. And it's going to be a horrible judgment. And through the next couple chapters, he deals with all the nations surrounding Israel at that time. And you know what? Those nations that were surrounding Israel, you know, 2,500, 3,000 years ago, uh, these, these names are current today. It's the, same, it's the same thing. The same stuff is going on. Listen to what he says. And, and there's a formula here. It's like kind of like a, a mantra that he repeats over and over again. Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Damascus and for four. It's like an idiom. Meaning for all the stuff you're doing wrong. Okay. I will not turn away the punishment thereof. He mentions Damascus, which is what? That's in Syria. It's the Syrians. He says that if you drop down to verse 6... Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Gaza. Where was the Gaza Strip? It's still there. It was the Philistines of his day. Today it's Hamas. It's the same thing. Dropping down. And, and, and if you, you can read in detail the things that he said would happen to these, to these different nations. And they did in history happen to them. Thus says the Lord in verse 9. For three transgressions of Tyrus. Tyre. That would be like Lebanon. Tyre and Sidon, there's still, there's still cities there called Tyre and Sidon, although they're not exactly the same cities that were in his day. But he's, he's speaking to all these nations. 
He says, uh, in verse 11, Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Edom. And then in verse 13, for three transgressions of the children of Ammon. Edom and Ammon, there would be where like Jordan is today. In, in chapter 2, he talks about Moab. Those three groups of people, well, we know Ammon and Moab, we know where they came from, right? Know where Ammon and Moab came from? They came from the incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughters, all the way back in Genesis, uh, when Lot fled from Sodom and Gomorrah, and his daughters tricked him into having sex with him, and they had children, Ammon and Moab, the Moabites and the Ammonites. And Edom, of course, they were descendants of Esau, who was the brother of Jacob, the brother of Israel. <laughs> the one who sold his birthright. These three, these three peoples would make up what today would be Jordan. So we see all these nations surrounding, completely surrounding the nation of Israel. And Amos pronouncing judgment on them for the things that they have done. And again, we're not going to go into detail right there, but look at verse 6 of chapter 2 and just dropping down. Thus says, I'm sorry, chap, uh, verse 4 of chapter 2. Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Judah and for four. Now he's getting personal. Now he's getting with his own people. Now he's talking about Judah. And listen to what he says about Judah. Now the other nations were the nations around him, but now he's, now he's speaking judgment on his own. He says, I will not turn away the punishment thereof because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments, and their lies caused them to err, after the which their fathers have walked. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem. And in verse 6, he finally focuses in, because primarily Amos was sent to the northern kingdom. Remember we had said, and we always like to remind you, that the, the nation of Israel was separated into the southern kingdom, which was uh, Judah and Benjamin, they were the ones that occupied Jerusalem. And the northern kingdom were the other ten tribes, and they were up north. They, they were occupied Samaria. When they broke away from, uh, from, from Jerusalem, a fellow named Jeroboam was their first king. He built uh, 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 two places to worship, one in Dan and one in Bethel. And uh, he built golden calves. So immediately they went into idolatry. So we're going to read here as we go through Amos, we're going to see the name Bethel. It means their center of worship, okay, where they worshipped with, with their God, which they called Jehovah, but it wasn't. It says, verse 6, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment because they sold, now listen, they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. Man, their stock market hit 13,000. <laughs> They, they were, they, they, their economy was rolling. They were, they, were, they were people getting wealthy. But what did they do to get there? It says, they sold the righteous for silver. They made merchandise of the people of God. That's what they did. Man, yeah, read the newspapers. See, one thing I like about Amos, and, and again, you know, in Christian... And Christian circles, there are like two sides, okay? There's the one side who is uh, the conservative, you know, free market, free enterprise, you know, okay? And there's the other side who are like the liberation theology guys. They're the ones who really don't care about what the Bible says. They think, they think to really be a Christian, you have to go help the poor. And then there are those on the other side that say, let the poor take care of themselves, <laughs> okay? Well, you should help the poor. I mean, you know, that's, uh, we were called, it was uh, encoded in their law that those that had stuff would leave stuff for those that didn't. And the ones that didn't have stuff would have to work for it. Unless they were, unless they were sick, unless they couldn't, you know, they, were, they wanted to make provision for those that could not work, and that's important to do that. But for those who were, uh, if you read the book of Ruth, Ruth and, and her mother-in-law came back, to, uh, to Bethlehem, and they didn't have anything, so Ruth would go out and work, you know, for, and, and the people that owned the land and, and, and the farmers, they were commanded to leave the corners of the field unharvested so that there would be some place for the people to glean, the people who were poor, and that's, that's what God, that was God's provision for the, for the lost, and, and we should be aware and we should be you know, willing and able to help those that, that, are, that are needy. 
But see, you know, it seems like it goes one way or the other. It's like it's all that or it's none of that. Amos here addresses those people that thought, hey, who needs them? They saw people as a number. Come on, you know, if you ever work in a place and you were just a number? Or you ever, you know, been somewhere and you were just, just, another, just another piece of machinery? You know, I think, of, I think of the Industrial Revolution in the United States of America. And there was a time, and, you know, Dale knows, because when we were going to, uh, when we worked at Allegheny Ludlam, we would have to go to these safety, safety classes. And they talk, I, I forget what year it was, there was a, there was a, a year of death in, in the city of Pittsburgh, back in the 1920s, I guess it was, or the, the, somewhere way back when, where there was like two or three deaths every day in a steel mill some, somewhere in Pittsburgh. If somebody get killed, they just haul them out and put somebody else in. You know. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of why sometimes unions are here. I'm not going to get into that, all right. But <laughs> that's another story. But the thing is, you know, there are those, you know, I, 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 there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. There's nothing wrong with being a business owner. But, you, ought to, you know, the Bible says you, they ought to treat their workers right. Okay. Nothing says that the worker should have as much money as the guy who owns a company. Okay, and there's nothing in the Bible that says everybody should have, you know, the same. You've got, you got people who are, who are wealthy, you've got people who don't, don't got that much. You always have that. Everybody's the same in God's eyes. God doesn't see anybody who's rich and poor. But, you know, you've got folks that own the place and folks that work there. I didn't expect to make as much money as a guy that owned Allegheny Ludlam Steel. Okay, I didn't. But, you know, you have a contract, you want to get a good wage. So, anyway, I'm, I'm getting off the Amos dealt with the people who were making merchandise out of God's people. Okay. Drop, drop down and just, just again, we're just going to hop through here a little bit. Just looking at some passages. Look at chapter 3. And Amos is full of some heavy judgment. Heavy, heavy judgment. For nine, almost nine chapters, heavy judgment. Listen to what he says. Verse, uh, chapter 3. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. You know the fact that we're born again Christians, we're going to be held accountable more. God expects us, who know more, to be responsible more for how we live. Okay? Listen to what he says. Can two walk together? See, there's some great passages in Amos. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Reminds me of what Paul said over in Corinthians. Be not unequally yoked. If I'm going this way and you want to go this way, and we're, and we're both tied up to the same yoke, and I want to go this way and you're going this way, we're just going to go in circles. How can two walk together? How can we say, and, and, and the implication, you call yourself the children of God, you're Israel, but how can you call yourself Israel when you're not doing what God says you ought to be doing? God's going this way and you're going this way. And the same thing applies today. There's all kinds of folks saying, praise the Lord, I'm born again, and said the prayer, but God's going this way and they're going that way. How can we walk together unless we be agreed? He said, will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he has uh, taken nothing? He says, Shall, uh, can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord has not done it? Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he reveals secret, uh, his secret unto his servants. You know what? God always announces. Everybody says God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to birth. No, he doesn't. He tells you exactly what he's doing. His word tells us exactly how he operates. It's no surprise. You know, I wonder what God's going to do. Well, you know, check out in his word. You know, what's, what's, what is he going to do if, if sin is abounding? Well, how, well, how's he going to act? He, he shows us. He, these words to Israel, there was nothing new. They knew the law. God gave them the law in the wilderness. He told them the, the consequences of not obeying the law and the blessings of obeying the law. He doesn't keep things secret. 
A lot of people say, oh, I wonder if, why God's doing this. Listen, if, if, if God is doing it to you, he's going to tell you why. Sometimes, you know, people, sometimes things happen, and things happen, and it's not necessarily the Lord, okay? But if God's doing something to you, he's going to tell you why. He's not going to, like, let you, let you guess. He goes on, and he says, Publish in the palaces of Ashdod, which is in uh, was Philistia, and in the palaces of Egypt, and say, Assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria, and behold the great tumults in the midst thereof, and the oppressed in the midst thereof. He says, Trouble's coming, Israel. Coming from your enemies? It's coming. For they know not to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Look at chapter 4, just jumping through a little bit. Please study this out. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan. Kind means like cows. He's being very facetious here. And he's, he's really speaking. Now he's, he's addressing the wealthy women. The, the uh, socialite women. The ones who, you know, the Lady Gagas and the Madonnas and the, okay. <laughs> that make money off of causing people to sin. They make big money out of leading children astray into sin and a life of debauchery. That's what they're doing. They get wealthy, ridiculously wealthy, by teaching little girls they ought to walk around looking like prostitutes. That that's a cool thing. Gaga, Lady Gaga. Okay. Hear this, you cows of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, come on, let's have a drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that lo, the day shall come upon you that he will take, away, take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. And you shall go out at the breaches every cow at that which is before her, and you shall cast them into the palace, says the Lord. He's saying, enjoy it now, ladies. Because the time is coming. There's another place, I believe, in Isaiah where he says, you know, all the dainty things, all the beautiful things are going to be gone. You're going to be dressed in sackcloth and ashes. He says in verse 4, he says, Come to Bethel and transgress at Gilgal. Multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifice. Come on. Come to church and your tithes every three, more, every three years. And offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this likes you. Oh, you, you love to be religious. You love to go through the motions. Yeah, you do it your way. You want to come to me on your terms. But God's saying, listen, you can't come to me on your terms. I won't accept you on your terms. Especially when you're doing such wickedness. I always get a kick at when these folks get up and they win these awards and they say, I thank God. I thank God. They don't know who they're talking about. They have no clue who they're talking about. He says, uh, just, just uh, dropping down a little bit. There's so much judgment. Uh, uh, drop down to chapter 5. and Just for, for time's sake, I don't want to dwell. Look at chapter 5. He says, look at verse 4. For thus says the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye me, and you shall live. But seek not Bethel, which was their, their, their temple, their idolatrous temple, nor enter into Gilgal, and pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal surely shall go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to naught. Seek the Lord and you shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. You who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth, seek him that makes the seven stars in Orion and turns the shadow of death into the morning. This God that created everything. That's where we need to start turning. Now if you would say that today, I, 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 I'm, I really kind of got to charge out of this recently I was I was watching and they were talking about Rick Santorum who's running you know for president and I guess a year a couple of years ago he, he said something about Satan's plan for the United States 
Okay? I mean, he was, he said, you know, the father of lies wants to destroy, that's what he said. And oh man, they're having a field day with that. You know, they're, they're painting him like some kind of, don't they understand, can't they see the stuff that has happened in this nation over the last 20, 30 years? I mean, God bless Rick Santorum, I, he's, say, he's telling it like it is. Probably ain't going to get him elected. But at least he's telling it like it is. He said, if they want to bring up stuff I said, religious stuff a couple years ago, let them bring it up. It's true. He says, look at verse uh, 21 of chapter 5. Listen to what God says. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs. I will not hear the melody of thy vials. He said, listen, turn the amps off. Turn the PA system off. Put the mics down. Last night, or uh, Monday night, Brother Bob Critty was here for the men's meeting. He was talking about stuff that's going on in what they call the emergent church today. They have great music. But no word. They have, they have well-produced worship services, but they don't tell the truth. God says, listen, he stops his ears and holds his nose and says, I don't want to hear it. If you can't live righteous, if you can't look at yourself and be holy, if you don't care about how you're living, I, I don't want your worship, I don't want your offerings, I don't want your sacrifices. It's a stench in my nostrils. It's not a sweet-smelling savor. He says in verse 25, you've offered me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, uh, O house of Israel. But you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chiam, your images. Th those, were, those were the gods of the Canaanites. Hideous gods. That would require human sacrifice. That's the gods they were worshipping. And calling, it, calling him Jehovah, calling him Yahweh. He says, therefore I, will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, and the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Look at chapter 6. Now here we go. United States of America. But here we go. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Those who feel so comfortable. Those who feel so secure. Because we've got a good army. Because we've got a good navy. Because we've got nuclear bombs. Because we've got a good economy. Everything is okay. Man, we live, yeah, we live in the greatest country and everything's going to it. Man, you better, you better watch out when you start thinking like that. Yeah. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. You think you're so safe. God says you're not safe. Pass you into Kelna and see and from thence and go to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are, they better than the, uh, uh, are you better than these kingdoms? Or their border greater than your border? See, God said, I dealt with them. I'm going to deal with you. Can we think we can escape God's judgment? Because we're a Christian nation? Because we're the United States of America? He says, verse 3, you that put away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory. Again, here he's talking about the wealthy, opulent. Lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the vial and invent to themselves instruments of music like David, that drink wine and bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments. But they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Is anybody mourning for what's going on in our nation? They were, living, they were living large. They were living big. And they didn't care that their people were struggling. They didn't care that the poor were suffering. They didn't care that idolatry was reigning in their land. They didn't care about that stuff. This is, this is, we could stand on a street corner today and preach this, and it's pertinent, as pertinent today in the United States of America as it was back then. Because there's a whole lot of people making a lot of money. Everybody's talking about bad economy. Man, I don't know. What, I mean, I see, I see some people doing really well. And they don't give two hoots about what God thinks. They don't care about, what's, you know, about sin. They make a mockery of sin. 
Yesterday was, you know, Fat Tuesday. Mardi Gras. A satanic festival. A satanic festival. If you ever, ever, ever watch that, ever watch pictures of Mardi Gras. It's a satanic ritual. They have, they have, they have uh, these, these kings, which are really demonic representations of demons, marching through fields, and they beads, and there's women exposing themselves, and drinking, and drugs, and all this, all this stuff going on. And we said, we want to get it over with before we get to Ash Wednesday, you know. What a joke. Then we'll give something up for 40 days, right, Lent? So if you're going to give it up for 40 days, why don't you give it up forever? Okay? They party. They drink wine in bowls. And they got music. and uh, Oh, man. But they don't care. They don't care that sin abounds. Sin is running wild on our nation. They don't care. They don't understand that you can't uh, turn on a TV set and not see some kind of filth of pornography in primetime TV stations. They don't care. They don't care that these music stars are, are literally leading our children into, into uh, all kinds of sin and, and uh, sinfulness. They don't care because the money flows. We're making money. It's good. Money, 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 money. He says, therefore now shall they go captive with the first that go captive, and the, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. You know when... When, when, when the hard time comes, the ones who stand the most to lose are the ones who are going to suffer the most. You know, I don't have a whole lot. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I ain't got a whole lot to lose. Remember, you read stories back in old 1929 when they had the big, uh, big depression? Guys were jumping out of windows. That depression, by the way, was man-made, you know that? I don't know if you, ever, if you ever read about that or studied that. But the ones, the ones who were pulling the strings, they made everything look like it was really good. Then they sold. <laughs> right down. Man, 13,000. Man, we're doing good. Until the next 9-11. <laughs> uh, drop down a little bit again. A few more, just a few more passages. We're, we're getting to the end. Read it all for yourself. It's really, it's heavy. Heavy judgment in this book. Heavy judgment. Heavy judgment. Look, look down at thou. Look at verse uh, 7, chapter 7. Amos is teaching with, with some examples here. And this is a go good one. Thus he showed me, Amos is saying, he showed me and behold the Lord stood upon a wall made by a, what, a plumb line. Those of you who ever built anything, you know what a plumb line is. No matter where you put that plumb line, it's always going to point to the center of the earth. You can be on top of a mountain, you can be on the bottom of a valley, you can be on a hill like this. When you hold it up like this, that thing, that's going to be straight up and down. God's word is a plumb line. You can't change it. God's word will, will teach you right from wrong. You can't change it. Amos says God has a plumb line. He's measuring us by his word. He's telling that to Israel here so many thousands of years ago, and he's saying that to us. He's measuring, he's measuring his church by his word today. He says, The Lord said unto me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, uh, I see a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. I'm going to, listen, I'm going to judge and I'm not going to cut any breaks. I'm going to judge. If God judged his people back then, he's going to send judgment today. Okay? Dropping just a, a, a little bit more. Look at, look at verse uh, 10. Now, th th this is like one of the first places where we see like a personal thing here. Okay? Because up to this, Amos is like, he's laying it down. He's laying the word down. But you know, he was not popular amongst those people, because it says, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. Now again, if you remember, if you go back in history, when Jeroboam I began, when he split off from, the, from uh, Jerusalem, he got like, he was looking for priests. He built these temples and put these golden calves in them. 
And he built these temples, and he was looking for people to be priests. And the people he hired to be the priests were not like the top of the cream of the crop. Okay. He looked for anybody. He probably looked for people that didn't have nothing better to do. And say, here, I'll give you a white robe and a hat. And so this Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, was probably not like, you know, the winner of the Man of the Year award, okay? He sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, and he said, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. It's just what they say today about a Rick Santorum or about a... Uh, uh, Brother Keyes, uh, what's, what's Keyes' first name? I can't uh, Alan, Alan Keyes, you know. He'll stand up and tell the truth. They can't, they can't take it. You stand up and you start talking about sin, and they'll, and they'll mock you, they'll ridicule you, they'll have a field day with you on Comedy Central. For thus, listen to what uh, Am, this Amaziah, this priest said, For thus Amos says, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and he did. And Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. And they were. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, Hey Amos, shut up and go home. Go talk to, go tell, go to Judah and tell them this stuff. We don't want to hear your stuff. Don't prophesy up here anymore in Bethel. It's the king's chapel. Leave us alone. And Amos, I love him. Amos said, look, I didn't apply for this job. I'm not here because, you know, I like to be, you know, I like to be a contrary. God told me to come here and say this. Thank God for the men and women of God who are standing up and telling the truth today. It's not popular. They'll be made fun of. They'll be ridiculed. But you know what? I'm, I'm, I could find something better to do with my time than stand up and say some of this stuff. But it's truth. We've got to know the truth. When you're talking to people, Brother Dill was sharing me a little bit of testimony. He was, he was sharing with somebody. You've got to know the truth. Why is things happening the way they're happening? Because we threw God out. We've thrown God out. Threw him out of the schools. Thrown him out of government. We threw him out. A lot of people threw him out of the church. We threw him out. Dropping down just a little bit more. <clears throat> Look at... Uh, Chapter 8. I look at verse 4. <clears throat> Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. But, man, it's, it's today. Saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? And the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. He, what they were doing was they were ripping the people off. They had false balances. God says he hates false balances. You know, instead of getting a pound, they were getting 15 ounces. You know, and paying a pound. Just like today. <laughs> Used to be you'd get like a pound, now there's like 12 ounces. Same price. Just like today. Somebody's making on. Somebody's making some money on. Okay. He says, he says, look at verse 6, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. There he, he uses that terminology again. And sell the refuse of the wheat. We'll buy, buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes and we'll give them the worst that we can find. Make money. It's what's going on today. I think of, you know, the last couple of years, all these, all these companies that went under and the big shots that ran a place. They had themselves prepared. You know, we think about old Enron. Brother Steve uh, uh, Pelican used to work for Enron. And, 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 man, that place went down. And the folks, the, the few folks on the top, they made out all right, but everybody that had their money invested ended up with zero. And the, and the leaders of them companies say, oh, well, you know, we are, we are. Amos. Just the same stuff is going on. Verse 7, the Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget. You know, God will make things right. God will make, if they don't do it in this life, 
God's going to make it right. Shall not the land tremble for this and everyone mourn that dwells therein? Shouldn't the United States of America be cringing and crying out to God? After everything has happened in the last 20, 30 years since I've been you know, old enough to understand what's going on, shouldn't America be on her knees crying out? Shouldn't our leadership be crying for prayer and fasting and calling out to God for repentance? Now they say, keep it in your church Sunday morning. Keep it there. Don't, don't bring it over here. We're running it over here. You, you do what you want to in your church. Just keep it there. See, the problem is too many people have kept it here. <laughs> too many people have kept it in church on Sunday morning. Too many people don't want to live out this life. They want, to, they want both, the best of both worlds. So shouldn't the land tremble for this? Like I, I know I, I've said it before. I'll never forget that mayor of New Orleans shaking his fist and saying, yeah. We'll have our Mardi Gras. Is anybody crying out to God, realizing this is judgment? Look at verse 11. Just little nuggets. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a food famine. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water. But of hearing of the words of of the Lord. Not a famine of the word of the Lord, but of hearing of the word. Now we've got so many Bibles floating around. All kinds of Bibles. Recovery Bibles, uh, you know, African American Bibles, Italian Bibles, uh, kids Bibles. Yeah, there's a Bible for, you know, making gay Bibles. We got Bibles, we've got Bibles. This version, that version, this version. With all the Bibles we have, man, we should be the holiest people on the face of the earth. But nobody listens. They have it. We have it. We read it. But nobody listens. And now in some churches, they don't want to really deal with the Bible because it's just that old, you know, it's not for today. It's a, that's old. We need, a, we need to reinvent. That's, that's the key word today, reinvent. We need to reinvent how we feel about things. We need, I, mean, I mean, that was for them back then, a thousand years ago. This is 2012. Who needs that? There's a famine of the hearing of the words of the Lord. There was back then, and there is today. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, and shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. People are running everywhere to find Oh, man, man, we're looking for like angel feathers and gold dust and gold teeth. And we want, oh, we want, you know, we want all this stuff. But have somebody stand up and say, you better repent and be saved. You're going to end up in hell. We don't want that because that's not pleasant. That demands too much of me. Let me go someplace where stuff is happening. And ooh, it can be spooky. <laughs> yeah. okay. In that day... Shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst? They that swear by the sin of Samaria and, and say, Thy God, O Dan, lives, and the manner of Beersheba lives, even they shall fall and never rise up again. Listen, judgment's coming. Judgment is coming. Now after all that, eight chapters of judgment and harsh and, I mean, heavy judgment, I thank God for chapter 9. Because he says this. Look at verse 11 and we're going to close. He says, well look at verse 10. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. Oh. Then he has verse 11. In that day, thank God for that day. In that day, Will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen? Do you know where this is quoted? Over in Acts chapter 15, when they were talking about what to do with the Gentiles. The tabernacle of David was open to anybody. Not just the Jew. It was open to the world. You read in Acts chapter 15, they quote the scripture. He says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. You mean, God, listen, after all this judgment, as I said, all these, all these prophets, they came and they spoke harsh judgment, but every one of them, almost every one of them, spoke restoration to the nation of Israel. 
See, God sends judgment, but he does it for a purpose. He never does it just to punish. But there's always restoration. He says that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And of all the, the heathen which are called by my name, says the Lord that does this. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, uh, him that sows seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Happy days are coming, he says. After all this judgment, after the locusts and the, the plagues and the earthquakes and the fire and, and the famine and the drought, I will bring again, he says in verse 14, the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They also shall make gardens and eat the fruit thereof. And I will plant them among their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, says the Lord thy God. This is yet future to come, even though there's a nation of Israel. It's not there in belief like they are, but they're, they're going to be. And I believe this promise is the same. For the body of Christ. Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Peter said judgment's going to begin in the house of the Lord. We've quoted that scripture many, many times. And we've seen it happen. And we're going to see it happen more and more. But there will be a remnant and a restoration. God will have his way. That's what he's promised us. With all this, uh, this judgment, you know, when you, when you preach to the, 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 the prophets, the minor prophets, all this judgment, all this stuff is coming down. But there's always a promise that I'm going to make it right. See, we know when he talks about the restoration of Israel, we know that when Jesus comes back, sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, they're going to accept him as their Messiah. And the nation, all Israel, will be saved. That's what the word says. Saved by Christ. They're not saved just by being Jews. They're saved by trusting in Jesus Christ. But that's when, they'll, that's when they as a nation will own him. And he'll, own, he'll, be, he'll be their God and he'll be their people. In the meantime, the church, the body of Christ, saints, I just, I pray, you know, I see what, what, what goes on. We see what's happening in our nation, economically, politically, in the religious realm. God's hands are going to move. There's another place in there I kind of pass it over where he says, you know, for those of you that are waiting for the day of the Lord, you know what you're waiting for? It's judgment. But for those who are his, I'm not saying that we're going to, you know, hide, be hidden in the ground somewhere. But listen, for those who are his, his promise is he would never leave us or forsake us. And just like he was with the early Christians in the, in the first century, when they were enduring all kinds of persecution, he'll be with us too. He'll be with us too. Amen. All right, kind of a little quick review of Amos there. Read it when you get a chance. Anybody have any comments or questions or anything at all before we close? Yes, Donna. In verse 12, it says the remnant. Does that mean Israel? Of, of chapter 9? Yes, yes, I would, yes, I would say that. Let me, let me get there. I'll close it up. But they, they're, take, they're talking about the remnant of Israel here. But I believe it's also applicable. Yeah, 9 in, in verse 12. Yes, then they possess the remnant. Uh, they may possess the remnant of Edom. Okay, they're talking about the, the remnant. They're going to they're going to possess the land of Edom, which Israel is going to possess. That would be Jordan. Okay, so the, the remnant of Edom would be, uh, and it says, and of all the heathen which are called by my name, says the Lord. Jesus said that when He comes back, He's going to rule the nations. Israel will rule the nations. So that's the the, the word remnant there refers to the heathen. It, when Jesus returns, we're going to be subject to Christ. That's what that word remnant means. I'm glad you asked. I could look, see what it said. Okay. Anybody else have questions or comments at all? Okay. Praise the Lord. You ready for the rapture? <laughs> I'm ready for the rapture. Okay. I don't know when it's coming, but I'm ready for it. All hearts and minds clear. Okay, let's stand and we can close our service. Thank you, Father, for your word tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank uh, Lord, I thank you for the promise of restoration. I thank you, Lord, that, that, God, you are going to make things right, Father, as we see things happening in our nation, things that we know are, aren't right, Father. It's, it's, nothing has changed. It's, we read this prophet that wrote, you know, 2,500, 3,000 years ago, and, Father, nothing has changed. 
people still do what they, what they did and they still make merchandise of your people and they still try to take advantage of those who are less fortunate. Father, help us have a heart and a vision and discernment that we might be uh, sensitive to your leading. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory. As we go from this place, but not your presence, we thank you for um, testimony about our sister Shana. We pray for those, those young men and women in that place, Father, that you will uh, help them find their place in the service, Lord, and bless them in a special way, Father. We pray for those who are sick in our, in our midst, Father, for Cheryl and for our sister Darlene that's recovering from, has those broken bones. And I know that I can name so many. I know I'm going to forget a few. I, I just pray, God, you would lay your hand upon those in our midst who are ill. And, and Father, for our loved ones who are lost, we pray for salvation. For those who are addicted, for those who are sold into sin, Father, I pray for your, your divine touch upon them. Lord, we thank you, Father. Help us stand for righteousness. Father, I thank you, Lord. We've seen some, some different faces come in here on Sunday morning. and I know a few of them. Some of them I don't know. But, Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us stand firm on your word. And they, they don't come here because they like the music. They don't come here. They come here because the truth and the spirit of God is, is here. Father, help us always be discerning of your truth because your word is truth. And we thank you. We give you glory. Pray you would be with us. Help us tell somebody about Jesus this week and bring us back at the appointed time. In the precious name of Jesus, everybody say.